Hi, good morning. My name is John Epstein, Vice President for Science and Outreach at EcoHealth Alliance. I want to thank Professor Mark Cotter and the organizers for inviting me to speak to you this morning, and I'm sorry that I couldn't be there in person to be with you, although I'm grateful that my colleagues from EcoHealth Alliance were able to make it over, because I think it'll be a very exciting and productive meeting. I wanted to spend the next half hour or so talking about some considerations when designing studies that involve free-ranging wildlife, particularly epidemiologic studies, whether they're wildlife disease studies or whether they're part of a One Health study that's multi-layered that might have people and livestock involved, but also has a wildlife component. Now, just like any other epidemiologic study, we use a lot of the same structural study designs for wildlife studies that we would for studies in people or in livestock. You can have descriptive studies that talk about the population demography of free-ranging wildlife, what you tend to see in terms of age structure, sex, separation, uh, population dynamics, metapopulations. You can look at um, the health status of animals very descriptively. A cross-sectional disease study is when you sample the animals at a specific point in time, and it gives you information about the status of infection, both at individual levels and at a population level, but only at a given point of time. It's really a snapshot. And cross-sectional studies can be very useful for understanding whether there's presence or absence of disease or evidence of exposure, say by antibodies. It might tell you the proportion of animals that have been exposed or infected at a given time. But it has its limitations because any pathogen or disease that has a seasonal component or a temporal component means that you could be there at the wrong time when you're sampling and not see any evidence of disease, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, that that disease isn't circulating in that population. So the way we get around that is by using longitudinal study designs. And this has become more and more common, particularly when studying bat-borne pathogens, but really anything in, in populations that might have a seasonal component, where we know that certain viruses tend to be shed at certain times of year. And that is when you study, when you test a population repeatedly over time, same population. And the frequency at which you test really depends upon a number of things. Whether you think that disease dynamics are impacted by certain temporal phenomenon within that wildlife species, maybe they're seasonal breeders, or they aggregate at certain times of year for breeding or for birthing. Maybe they're migratory, and so their population numbers change dynamically over the year. Um, so figuring out what what intervals at which you want to test, and of course it's dependent on the resources you have available to do so, but longitudinal studies can be really informative in looking at the dynamics of disease circulation, of pathogen circulation within a population. And of course, the longer that you can do these studies over repeated cycles, whether it's annual cycles or even longer, gives you even more information in case there's variation from year to year, and they're not necessarily seasonal or annual um, temporal factors that determine infection. Experimental studies can be very complementary to field-based disease studies that help you understand at a, an individual level how pathogens operate within the host, whether uh, how the pathology works, how transmission might work. Sometimes you're using traditional lab animal models that give you representation of a disease process you might see in people. Sometimes they're domestic animal models. Occasionally, we've been able to do experimental studies using wildlife hosts. Um, that's a little harder. It involves bringing free-ranging wildlife into a laboratory setting, but that can often give you a lot more information about how uh, a pathogen, say a virus, operates in its natural reservoir. And this can be really informative in terms of understanding what you see in the wild, because it's not always able to understand mechanism or understand why you're seeing a certain infection dynamic at a population level. In terms of surveillance, just like with human studies, you can have active surveillance where you're going out in a prescribed way and capturing and sampling for ancient wildlife. You can have passive surveillance if there's a setup in a certain uh, area or country where um, wildlife is monitored for die-offs and it's regularly reported to an authority. You might opportunistically sample based on uh, sick or injured wildlife or dead wildlife that's, that's um, observed and you get a, a sampling that way and re reporting that way. Um, and then there's syndromic surveillance in, in which there's active observation for disease in wildlife. And this requires a certain amount of effort, particularly in countries where there may not be a wildlife authority that is attuned to looking at disease or die-offs in free-ranging wildlife. Of course, it depends on the species, but um, this is noticing you know, particular disease phenomenon and reporting on that.
So some particular things to be aware of when you're planning a study in free ranging wildlife is you really have to understand the ecology of the species you're targeting. You know, is this a animal that lives in large populations or is more solitary? Is it migratory? What kind of environment or habitat does it tend to live in? And is that accessible? Uh, are there certain times of year it's there or not there? All of these things are important in terms of figuring out the logistics and the design of your study. And we have to recognize that wildlife studies have an inherent bias. Whenever you're capturing free ranging wildlife, sometimes it's, it's clear that there's a bias in how animals go into the traps or repeatedly go into the traps. Sometimes you may not be aware that if you're setting your traps in a certain location, you're inadvertently selecting for certain individuals that might be more likely to be in that area or wander into those traps, maybe juveniles, maybe certain adults that live in a certain segment of the population. For example, with um, fruit bats that roost in trees, there's a structure to the colony. Certain individuals and certain types of animals will be in one part of the roost. Juveniles might be in another, you know, uh, adult males in one part, females in another. And if you set your net in a certain place, you will select for certain animals uh, in your sample, in your capture. So you have to be aware of those kinds of biases that are there. Um, Using the appropriate technique, of course, totally depending on the wildlife species, you have to have uh, someone with expertise and experience in capturing and handling that species to make sure that you're doing the capture in a way that's effective, that isn't going to injure or is least likely to injure the animal or any of the staff working on the project. Uh, so there are certain techniques that are particular to certain species. And we think about diagnostic platforms, we'll get into that a little bit later, but the type of samples you collect and the testing you do has a lot of influence on the kind of data you'll get, and of course how that data is analyzed and interpreted. And lastly, it's really important to understand the conservation status of the animals you're working with. Some animals are protected under law, you have to make sure you have appropriate permits and approvals. If you're planning to export biological samples, those are protected under trade conventions like CITES as well as sometimes uh, other conventions um, or certain countries may require certain permits for samples coming in to belong to a certain animal group. The United States CDC regulates samples coming in from rodents and bats, and so you have to have a special permit there. The Fish and Wildlife Department also has to um, issue permits for importation. So when you're moving samples or biologic materials internationally, you have to be aware of those permits. But you know, more importantly, you have to be aware of the conservation status of the species you're working with, because if it's protected or if it's rare or endangered, you have different, different considerations in terms of the sampling you do, how you handle those animals. Um, and of course, the, the concern will be greater if there's any kind of injury or if there's destructive sampling where you need to take an animal and, and euthanize it for some reason, that will have more impact on the population if it's a, a rare or endangered species versus a common and abundant species. So these are all things that need to be considered when you set up your study design. Also, in terms of the scientific question you're asking, sample size becomes very important. If you're asking epidemiologic questions about the prevalence of a disease in a population or whether one population of animals has a higher prevalence of disease than another, it requires a certain sample size to have statistical confidence that you're gonna find the disease if it's there or the pathogen if it's there, and that you're gonna have enough power in your analysis to compare one population to another. So you want to make sure that your sample size is adequate and that the population you're sampling is representative of the population at large. Sometimes wildlife species are more solitary, live in very small groups, and it's very challenging to get an adequate sample size. And so sometimes you just have to discuss limitations like that in the study when you're writing up your results because it's just simply not possible to get as large a sample size as you might want. If you're doing anything like a mark recapture study or you want to track individual disease status by recapturing individuals, that's particularly challenging with free ranging wildlife. And that's a challenge that um, isn't quite as bad in livestock or in people where it's much easier to follow up individual animals or individual people. But with wildlife, it could be very difficult to recapture. If animals are solitary in nature, again, this speaks to their ecology, it might be difficult to locate them in the first place to get a sample. Are you going to be able to get a direct sample from that animal, or do you want to try to use um, a sampling technique that is environmental, such as collecting feces or urine? It doesn't require capture of an individual necessarily, but it might allow you to, to find bio biological samples opportunistically uh, on the forest floor or on a substrate. And then, of course, you have to discuss your sample size and whether it's adequate or inadequate in terms of answering the question you want to answer.
Now, what types of animals to sample? <clears throat> Sometimes there's a tendency to look for sick or injured wildlife uh, because you're looking at a certain disease state. But if you're studying viruses or other pathogens in their natural reservoir, quite often it doesn't cause overt disease in those animals. And that's for a lot of different reasons, but primarily because of the evolutionary history between pathogen and host, that it, where they've gotten to a point where there's transmissibility, but perhaps minimal disease. Or in the case of bats, as we're learning that bats simply have immunological mechanisms to cope with infection that often doesn't lead to overt signs of clinical disease. But whatever the reason, it can be important to survey healthy animal populations, even if you're looking for a microbe like a virus or bacteria known to be zoonotic or known to cause significant disease in livestock or other animal species. But when you're dealing with uh, an animal that might be a natural reservoir, you want to make sure you're capturing uh, and testing healthy animals as well. And there are examples of that, plenty of examples, but here are just a few, you know, hantavirus in rodents or hennepaviruses in bats don't cause overt disease, um, herpes viruses, maccasine herpes viruses in macaques uh, cause very minimal disease, even though that they can be severe in people when they transmit. Now, having said that, there are also wildlife species that are susceptible to infection and, and uh, suffer from significant clinical disease from zoonotic pathogens. So they may not be reservoir species, but they might be hosts that are susceptible. And I think a, a prime example are great apes with Ebola. So right now, the you know, preponderance of evidence really points to bats, various bat species as being natural reservoirs for filoviruses that include Ebola viruses, Marburg virus. And we know that there have been significant infections and die-offs in great apes in Central Africa back in the early 2000s, gorillas and chimpanzees that have been infected by Ebola virus. And so here's an example where you might be doing surveillance, um, syndromic surveillance, where you're detecting hemorrhagic fever or die-offs in great ape populations to study Ebola. And so they're not a natural reservoir, but they are a wildlife species that's impacted by infection with a zoonotic pathogen. The same was true in the United States for West Nile virus. When that was introduced in 1999, this is a, a virus that lives in birds, but uh, North American crows and related birds, you know, jays and other corvids, were incredibly susceptible to West Nile virus. So this is a virus spread by mosquitoes, but there were severe crow die-offs that were observed as West Nile virus entered the United States via New York and slowly spread across the country. We started to see crow die-offs in a wave of infection. And so monitoring wildlife for disease and die-offs can be a really good way to do surveillance to understand a pathogen and see its movement, particularly if the natural reservoir might not be known at the time. Similarly, we see crow die-offs in South Asia for H with H5N1. Um, when there are waves of H5N1 circulating, particularly in poultry or poultry markets or mi migratory waterfowl, we have seen large-scale crow die-offs in urban centers around live bird markets and they've been tested and tested positive for H5 influenza. So the next thing is to think about the technique you're going to use. And every species, every group of wildlife has its own particular techniques that are appropriate and effective and have been tried and tested. Um, but the, at the end of the day, you have to make sure that the capture techniques you're using are safe, effective, ethical, and humane. Right. So here's a picture of a small fruit bat caught in a mist net. And so I've seen, you know, for, in a lot of bat studies, there's a tendency sometimes to put up mist nets and walk away and just leave the nets open and let however many bats get caught and tangled up as possible and then come back at a certain point in time and disentangle them. Um, but there are real problems with that, particularly because as bats become tangled, they start to stress out and struggle and try to free themselves. They can injure themselves. They can actually die from stress. They can be preyed upon by predators that might be in the area. They can injure each other if two bats are caught in the net next to each other. So we make it a, uh, a practice to always be present at nets when we're catching bats for that very reason. And as soon as a bat becomes entangled, we go in and disentangle it and um, put it in a cloth bag for sampling later. But really make sure that we're attending the traps or nets um, in this case so that we avoid injury. Now, something like rodent traps, those can be set and left overnight because the presence of a person there might scare away the rodent so that it doesn't go into the trap. But in this case, we know that these individual traps are just going to allow rodents to go in. They're going to be protected from the elements, protected from predators, and so it's safe to leave them there for a few hours overnight until morning.
We'll talk about ethical considerations in a bit when we talk about protocol review, but of course we want to make sure that the capture technique we're using is ethical. Now part of the study design is what type of sampling you're going to do, and it depends on your scientific question. To give you an example, a lot of the studies I've been involved with looking at um, viral circulation and transmission from bats and other animals is really interested in understanding A, whether an animal is infected or not, and B, whether it's shedding virus or not. And to be shedding virus is to look at the roots of excretion, typically saliva, urine, feces. Um, we'll collect blood to look for antibodies to see if there's exposure or whether there's evidence for the virus in the blood. But I usually don't collect organ tissue. And so the type of sampling we do is non-destructive. In other words, we're catching animals, we're collecting samples of excretia, taking blood, and then releasing the animal on site where we caught it um, with as minimal stress and no harm to the animal every time. But there are times when the question might be, well, if the animal may not be shedding virus, but is it still infected? And sometimes viruses hang out in organ tissue, sometimes at low levels, and you won't detect it in excretia, but you may detect it if you test kidney, liver, lung, intestines, um, lymph nodes or salivary glands. It really depends on the virus and the study. And so sometimes it is warranted and it is necessary to euthanize an animal and collect tissue samples from different organs to really understand pathology, pathogenesis, um, tissue tropism, you know, which tissues are infected, where the, where the pathogen hangs out in an animal. And so um, these are very different considerations in terms of study design, in terms of number of animals studied, but it can be an important consideration whether you do destructive or non-destructive sampling. And again, goes back to understanding the conservation status of those animals that you're testing to make sure that you're not planning on doing large amount of destructive sampling on, a, on an endangered or protected species. Depending on where you're working, um, you also want to be very aware of the social customs and cultural mores around the animals that you're working with. This is particularly true if you're working outside of your own culture, outside of your own country, um, and, and you, you know, hopefully are working with local partners who do understand the local perspectives, but oftentimes there's a lot of engagement with the public, there's a lot of perception by the public of the type of study you're doing when you're doing surveillance work. And so I'd say that's just probably true anywhere you're working. You want to make sure that you have a good understanding of public perception and understanding of the animals that you're studying. In terms of deciding what type of samples to collect, again, it depends on the scientific question you're asking. If you want to look at infection status, you might want to collect samples that allow you to do molecular detection using PCR-based platforms or viral culture or bacterial culture. If you're looking at whether exposure has occurred in that animal, then you want um, blood so you can collect serum or plasma and look for antibodies. Again, if you're asking questions about shedding, you want to get samples of excretia. So we often do um, <clears throat> oropharyngeal swabs, rectal swabs, urogenital swabs, or collect urine or feces. All of these things you know, allow us to test different, different systems and different routes of excretion. Are you interested in <clears throat> understanding the genetics, the evolution of the pathogen, in which case you're going to want to do PCR um, analysis. So you have to make sure you have the right preservative, the right samples, the right cold chain to make sure you're going to um, you know, protect whatever viral uh, genetic material might be in that sample between the field and the lab. Um, are you interested in host genetic sequence? Sometimes it's important to take a tissue sample from the animal you're sampling if it's not easy to identify that species and you want to use genetics to barcode or to identify the species. That's particularly true with rodents and bats where there's so much species diversity and it can be really challenging to accurately identify the species unless you're a, a taxonomist. Um, and even so, sometimes you know, barcoding is just really the, the most accurate thing you can do. Pathology, again, if you, if you want to understand what's going on inside um, organ tissues, then you want to collect organ samples, and that gets back to destructive versus non-destructive sampling. And then what type of testing platform you use is also directly tied to the question you're asking. And you have, you have to find out, are there testing platforms available that have been used with the species you want to study or that can be used with those species? Nowadays, there are a lot of testing platforms that are fairly agnostic in terms of species. For example, PCR can be used on any sample, whether it's a person, a domestic animal, a wildlife species, doesn't need particular validation. Whereas ELISA's often need to be validated on the, the species you're using it on because different serum can behave differently in, in the assays. 
Um, understanding the sensitivity and the specificity, you know, how often you're going to get false negatives and false positives when you use these tests is important. Is there a gold standard test for the pathogen you're studying? And if so, do you have access to that? Do you need to set up a two-tiered testing system where you might screen using one diagnostic assay like an ELISA, but then corroborate it with what might be a gold standard assay like a serum neutralization test? So being aware of, of how tests are you know, considered in the scientific community and what the gold standard is, is important. And then what facilities are available for testing in country, in the region? Is it a pathogen that requires biosafety level three or four? And are those facilities available for testing? If not, can you partner with a laboratory that has appropriate biosafety levels so that you can test the samples you're collecting for the pathogen you want? Now, understanding bias in your sampling is important. We talked earlier about whether a sample is representative or whether you, know, you set your trap or your net a certain place that might bias the type of sample you get. And the same is true for um, if you do opportunistic sampling. For example, a species might be hard to capture in the wild, might have, take more effort than you have resources for. So you might decide that, if, hey, if that species is part of a local market system, if it's hunted and traded, you might opportunistically um, test animals that are brought in through the trade. But you have to also recognize and understand you may not under, you may not know where those animals came from exactly. Uh, the hunter may be catching from a certain source. Maybe it's more males than females. So you're going to have biases in that sample as well. Sometimes hunted animals tend to be older and easier to catch. They might be sick and injured. So that could uh, un unknowingly bias your, your sample study as well. So you want to do the best you can to have a representative sample of the population, but with wildlife especially, there are real challenges that can lead to the need to make compromises. And so as long as you discuss those limitations when you're writing up your results and you discuss biases, then, then you know, it's fine because it's the reality of working with wildlife. Now, probably many of you have, have gone into the field and done studies, understand the challenges of working in environments, particularly in remote settings, but there are real logistical considerations. And particularly nowadays where so many um, epidemiologic studies depend on the ability to test and detect virus, uh, to test and detect viruses in samples where there might be just trace amounts and preservatives and cold chain become critically important. So there's a real challenge in getting a sample from the animal in situ in the wild back to wherever that laboratory may be that you're testing it. And so you have to think about cold chain and transport. Am I transporting these samples in a preservative that can be at ambient temperature? Does it need to be on wet ice or dry ice or sometimes liquid nitrogen? Sometimes you have to transport that sample at ultra cold temperatures and keep it in ultra cold temperatures until testing so that you can maximize opportunity to detect a trace amount of virus in there by PCR or culture a small amount of virus in a sample Whereas if that sample were kept at room temperature, the virus would just deteriorate and you might not be able to culture it. You have to think about the equipment you're bringing into the field and of course, weather conditions, other hazards like other animals that might pose a hazard, snakes, do you have to carry antivenines? Where's the local hospital? Where's the clinic? You have to be able to understand, you know, routes of safety and evacuation. And is your target species gonna be there? You know, what's your ability to detect that animal if it's there, let alone capture it? And so all of these things factor into where you might work. And then of course, field team training. Um, sometimes it's very difficult to find people with experience working with free ranging wildlife. And I think that you know, we're seeing it perhaps more in the past five to 10 years than we saw in the previous 20 or 30 years. But typically uh, not a lot of people are trained, particularly veterinarians are trained to work with free ranging wildlife and collect biological samples for disease studies, although it's happening more and more, which is great news. And so team training becomes really important, not just for a quality of study reason, but sometimes for capacity building, making sure that there is a trained workforce that can do these kinds of studies, not just for your own, but for future studies as well. It's a really worthwhile investment. Making sure that the team is appropriately trained in not only the capture techniques and animal handling, um, and collecting the biological samples, but also in personal protective equipment, biosafety, physical safety, making sure that there are really clearly delineated protocols, SOPs that explain how the study is going to go and that the team is well versed and trained 
not only in the study design protocols, but also in safety protocols as well, since you're often going to be working in remote areas. Now, another really important consideration with study design is animal ethics. And, you know, it used to be that IACUCs or institutional animal care and use committees were set up at universities to oversee methodologies in biomedical studies, controlled laboratory experiments that used animals to make sure that those animals were, you know, being used minimally and responsibly and ethically. Okay? And more recently, IACUCs began to be asked to look at wildlife studies, wildlife protocols, um, studies that looked at free ranging wildlife. And this was unusual for Aya Cooks you know, about 15 years ago, but more and more they have you know, taken it upon themselves, and this is a great thing, to look at study protocols and make determinations about whether the techniques being used are indeed ethical and humane and make sense to, to the best of their ability. And typically Aya Cooks involve veterinarians, members of the public, members of the university. And so I would, I would say that whether it's an IACUC or another regulatory body that approves um, animal protocols with an ethical mindset, it's important to have your study reviewed by one of these ethical review bodies um, for lots of reasons. One, just to ask the right questions of you in terms of how you're going to handle these animals. But two, when you go to publish your studies, a lot of times journals require you know, that there's an approved ethical review protocol or IACUC protocol. And they want to see that you've done due diligence and making sure that the um, protocols you're using are humane and appropriate for the study you're doing. Now, importantly, IACUCs only review procedures on live animals. They're not interested in what you're doing with archived samples that were collected from animals or sampling dead animals at a marketplace or roadkill that you find on the side of the road. So this is really about the capture, handling, restraint, sampling, welfare and well-being of living animals that are gonna be involved in the studies. And it's important to make sure that each team member, anybody on the team who's gonna to be touching a live animal is appropriately trained and goes through whatever animal research training and ethical training is required from your local IACUC committee. So I wanted to kind of finish the talk with an example, a case study, if you will, of a, um, a disease study of Nipah virus in bats that I was uh, involved with in Bangladesh. That, that was really focused on different types of sampling in the reservoir species, Teropus medius, which is a large fruit bat uh, that it, it carries nebovirus normally, but we were asking questions about prevalence, um, about dyna infection dynamics in these bats, and how nebovirus spills over from bats into people. And so this is really a study that was built on years of work um, not just in Bangladesh, but in other countries, to get to an understanding of the ecology of Teropus bats and how they interact with people that allows for the spillover of these types of viruses. And if you're not familiar, Nipah virus is a paramyxovirus in the same family as measles, rinderpest, um, canine distemper virus, but in a, in a group of viruses that are carried by these large fruit bats and when they get into people, cause very severe central nervous system disease and are fatal um, between 40 and 75% of the time, sometimes 100% of the time, depending on the outbreak. And Nipah viruses um, and related viruses have a wide species tro uh, tropism, which means that they are able to infect a lot of different mammals. But we know that bats carry them. And so what do we know about the ecology of these bats? Well, in Bangladesh, it's very common to see trees with bat roosts in them, with bat colonies in them. They live very close to people. They're very common, so they can be found all over the country. In fact, this species is abundant and common throughout the Indian subcontinent. It's all across South Asia, in Sri Lanka, and in India, in Nepal, um, parts of Pakistan, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Myanmar, you can see. Um, this, this species is pretty common and they prefer fragmented degraded landscapes. So they tend to preferentially roost near human settlements and they're generalist eaters. They eat fruit, but a lot of the same fruit that people cultivate and eat. We did a study and found about 26 varieties of fruit eaten by both people and these bats. So very close association. So how did we design our study? Well, the scientific question we were asking was really twofold. We wanted to understand whether there was any difference in infection patterns in colonies of bats situated in the western part of Bangladesh, where most of the human outbreaks had occurred historically, versus populations in other parts of the country where there hadn't been any outbreaks of Nipah virus reported in people. So we set up a cross-sectional study that would look at eight colonies of bats, 100 bats per colony, 
four of them in the shaded area called the Nipah Belt, which is associated with previous Nipah virus outbreaks, and four colonies in other parts of the country, just to see if there was any difference in the prevalence of infection um, based on location. But we also want to understand if there was seasonality to infection in bats. And as I mentioned before, cross-sectional studies don't address that very well. So we set up a longitudinal study where we looked at a single population of Teropus situated in right in the middle of the Nipa belt in Faridpur, where a lot of human outbreaks had occurred. And we tested the same population of bats quarterly, every three months for a six year period to see if we could look at seasonal patterns of infection. So our methodology was to use mist nets and just notice that the technicians here in this picture who are catching and handling the bats are protecting themselves not only from biological hazards, they have eye protection to protect their eyes from splashes of urine when the bat's being disentangled from the net or saliva. They're wearing respirators to protect the airways, the nose, and mucosal membranes. They're also wearing uh, dedicated clothing that can be removed and either thrown away like a um, a Tyvek suit, or if it can be cleaned and disinfected, you know, exterior clothing that can be removed at the end of the day. And then also protecting themselves from scratches and bites because bats are also known to carry rabies and lysoviruses that could be transmitted through bites and scratches, but also just from physical injury. So using leather welding gloves for the person restraining the bat so they don't get scratched by those really sharp claws or bitten by those pretty sharp teeth that the bats have. So protecting ourselves both from physical and biological hazards. Um, in the case of Teropis, we don't do this for all bats, but for these bats, we anesthetize them using a gas anesthesia machine to make it easier to sample the bats and also to take the stress away from the bats as well. These are pretty nervous animals, they're prey animals, so anesthetizing them really you know, makes it easy to collect the samples we're going to collect with no stress to the animal. So for the longitudinal study, we use microchips with RFID. Um, pit tags under the skin between the shoulder blades so that if we recapture an individual, we can scan the animal and, and determine that and track individual infection status. We collect uh, blood, we collect um, swabs from the throat, we collect urine, feces, and all of these will be put in tubes and tested. And we set up a mobile lab right outside the colony, by the way. So as soon as the bats are sampled and then recovered from anesthesia, we release them right back into the colony. And then we collect environmental urine samples because we know that um, Nipah viruses tend to be excreted in urine. So we collect droplets of urine on plastic tarps from underneath the roosts. In this case, we um, from the holding bags, we use these cloth pillowcases to hold the bats while we're waiting to sample them. And we'd cut the corner off the bag and put in a falcon tube and just collect urine from the bat itself. And that was a great sample for testing. And so what, what kind of data do we get from the cross-sectional longitudinal study? Well, the cross-sectional study, just in short, told us that um, it was rare to detect an infected bat, but we found lots of bats with antibodies against Nipah virus. And in fact, every colony we tested, there was some proportion of bats that had uh, antibodies against Nipah, between 20 and 60% of them. And there was no difference in seroprevalence or infection prevalence between bat colonies in the Nipah belt and those outside the Nipah belt where there hadn't been human cases. This was a widespread virus that circulated widely and there was evidence for infection all across the country. Although it did matter based on location, statistically, there were differences in terms of our exposure rates that we saw, but it wasn't based on being inside or outside the Nipah belt. And then the mark, the recapture study, when we were microchipping bats, was really interesting. It was very difficult to recapture. Um, it was opportunistic. We weren't trying to recapture individuals specifically, but we had 56 recapture events out of about 2,300 animals that we marked. Um, so it's only about a 2.4% recapture rate, but it allowed us to understand some really fundamental things. One, something we had always suspected was these bats shift their roosting locations. So bats that we captured and microchipped in one roost location popped up in another one. And we were able to eventually, looking at the locations of recaptures, define this polygon or a roost complex, um, an area that bats would move around in pretty routinely. And that allowed us to feel confident that if we showed up at a roost we were sampling it and the bats were all gone, and we went seven kilometers down the road and found more bats, that they were really part of the same population and thus were still representative of the, sample, of the population we were trying to sample. So this is really important evidence for that. The second thing we learned from the recapture was that at individual levels, we saw bats that tested positive for antibodies against Nipah the first time we caught them, and then 
negative on subsequent recapture. So that sero reversion was the first evidence we had in free-ranging bats that immunity wanes, that they actually don't maintain antibodies for life after infection or exposure. And that's something we had suspected, but certainly didn't know until we saw it. So the recapture study was really valuable for that. And then the longitudinal study gave us some really good insight about the dynamics of infection over time. So this is the, the raw serology data. And just two things to mention here was that over the six year period, we saw significant fluctuations in the proportion of bats from this population that had antibodies. We saw periods of significant decline where antibodies waned at a population level and significant increases. And, and the seroprevalence ranged from 20% to about 75%. And so, what we imagine is that infections, outbreaks of Nipah virus happen in bats when herd immunity drops below a certain threshold. Enough bats are susceptible that when the virus is reintroduced, either by immigration of an infected bat or recrudescence, a bat that had been infected, kind of suppress that infection and then it reactivates, that can spark an outbreak within the bats. And of course, when there's a high number of bats infected at one time, shedding is more likely and infect, you know, human infections are more likely. And then we see subsequent spikes in seroprevalence as IgG antibodies respond. The second thing that was interesting is that we didn't see annual cycles of infection that you might expect with seasonal breeders where new pups are born into a population, they're susceptible and they get infected. So you see these annual cycles of infection, but instead, we saw that infection dynamics were driven, and we know this from, from modeling the data we got, but we saw that adult bats drive infection based on waning immunity. And so again, as herd immunity drops in the adult population and infection sparks opportunistically, it causes an outbreak. And the inter-epidemic periods we could see in this population were about two years. So it was about every two years we'd see an outbreak based on serology in these bats. So that was a really important insight we learned and would have only known from doing the longitudinal study. We also saw the trend over the six year period in general was a decrease, a decline in immunity. So immunity is temporary, it wanes, and bats can be susceptible to reinfection after losing immunity. We also looked at genetic diversity in Nipah virus. So by doing PCR studies and sequencing, when we found Nipah virus, we learned kind of two interesting insights. One is that the virus that was popping up in people during outbreaks was a reflection of the strain that was circulating in bats locally at the time, which is intuitive, but we were able to compare um, the strain diversity in a certain location and what was in the bats tended to match what was in people. And we also saw that there was stability, very little evolutionary change in Nipah virus in bats over time, over the six year period of the study in a given location, whereas when we sampled bats in different locations, we saw much more diversity in viral strains, including finding a strain that's shown in red there at the bottom that was so divergent from most of the strains we found that it was more closely associated with Malaysia strains of Nipah virus than Bangladesh strains. So two clades of Nipah virus circulating in the same bat species in Bangladesh, which has implications for uh, human clinical infection since the different strains are known to have different clinical features. So all of that is just to illustrate uh, one type of study design or multiple study designs used in a particular study to understand a disease or pathogen circulation in a wildlife species. And so just to conclude, things to really think about as we're, just, as we're setting up our wildlife studies, whether they're independent or part of a One Health study design, is to really pay attention to what structure, study structure you want to use, the sample size you think you can achieve, will it be representative, what types of samples you want to collect, and what statistical techniques you're going to use to analyze those samples. Always important to do that in advance of the study so you know what you're going to do with the data that you collect, you collect and what the limitations of those data will be. Um, making sure you understand bias in the samples you're collecting, understand the conservation status, the uh, ethics of the techniques you're using, and then the species you're working with. Uh, making sure you know what diagnostic platforms are available to you that you want to use to answer the scientific questions you have, and understand the limitations of those platforms. And making sure that the techniques you're using are safe, ethical, and effective for capture, restraint, sampling, type of sampling you're doing, whether it's destructive or non-destructive, make sure the impact on the population is going to be minimal. And then make sure that you've really accounted for all the biosafety considerations, personal protective equipment, disinfection of your field site, your equipment and materials, and making sure you're accounting for physical safety of the personnel working on the project. So 
that's kind of it. Just wanted to share some insights on the topic. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Again, I'm sorry I couldn't be there with you. Um, but if you do have questions, I'm sure there's plenty of folks in the room um, to discuss these things with. I'm available by email, epstein at ecohealthalliance.org. Feel free to get in touch with me directly if you wanted to ask questions about any of this. And I hope you have a productive and fruitful conference, and I look forward to meeting you and working with you in the future. Thank you very much.